If you live on planet Earth, it's hard to escape media coverage of some of the high-profile murder cases of recent years. We've all been bombarded with the trials of O.J. Simpson, Phil Spector, Robert Blake, and Scott Peterson. Why are, we fa why are we fascinated with these cases? And you may think you have nothing in common with either the murderers or the victims, but could anyone be a murderer? Could you unwittingly be doing something to help make yourself a victim? Today, Jane Velez Mitchell is here. She's author of Secrets Can Be Murder. She's commented on many of these stories for CNN, Headline News, and Court TV, and everyone else, I think. She takes an in-depth look at what some of the highest profile murder cases of our time say about our society and ourselves. Pleasure to have you here today, Jane. Great. Delighted to be here. Well, you have covered so many of these cases over the years, but now you get to really comment on them in the book. But I'm curious, can anybody be a murderer? Well, I don't know if anybody can be a murderer, but my point in this book, Secrets Can Be Murder, is that we like to think of criminals as another species. They're uh -huh. way over there. Yep. But the fact is that the secrets that they kill over are the very secrets that you and I and everybody else that has. We all have. And you know what? If you say at home, oh, I don't have a secret, you're lying. We all have secrets. <laughs> and you go secrets. into that in the book, right. Well, because there are a lot of things just in private life that would be embarrassing if made public, let mm -hmm. alone any, you know what I mean, just personal moments well, and listen, all of that kind of stuff. There's privacy and then there is shame. Okay. okay? A, a secret is something that you're ashamed of. Mm. A secret is a piece of unfinished business that you carry around with you wherever you go. And like a concealed weapon, you pretend that you are not carrying it. So what it does is it blocks you. It prevents you from moving forward comfortably in your life. Uh -huh. Secrets are about a handful of very fundamental human issues. That's why we have the same secrets as criminals do because we're both human beings. The secrets are usually about sex. Mm -hmm. They can be about infidelity, right. illegitimacy, sexual orientation. There's the usual standard issues about sex, sexual fetishes, sexual obsession. Uh -huh. Then there are issues that involve family secrets that are sometimes passed down generation to generation. Right. So uh, there are secrets about money. There are secrets about addiction. That's a huge area of secrecy. You got a gambling problem. You got a debt problem. A lot of times in these murders I covered, the wife had no idea that the husband was massively in debt, and that ended up being a trigger for murder. You want to give us an example from one of the cases of, of how one of the secrets did lead to murder? Well, uh, for example, the case right now of Neil Entwistle, and mm -hmm. he has not gone to trial yet, so he deserves the presumption of innocence, but he is this very handsome British guy mm. who married an American girl. They were living in England. They had a baby. They moved to America. He uh -huh. then did not have a job in America. His debt began spiraling, and yet their lifestyle did not uh, go to uh, having a jalopy and top ramen. They were driving a lease BMW. They were moving into a half a million dollar house. Well, he was secretly accumulating a lot of debt, and according to the affidavits, uh, um, when the wife asked him, how are we affording all this? He said, don't worry about it. It's under control. Under control. Whenever somebody <laughs> like a spouse or a lover is not honest about their finances, is not transparent about their finances, chances are they've got a toxic secret buried in So that's in a there. red flag. If it's there is a something red about flag. Money. And you say as a spouse, you have the right to know. What you the have the right are. to know. And one of the things that I say in this book is that read this book, Secrets Can Be Murder, because you can see how not to handle a secret. These are the worst case scenarios where these people right. did not deal with the honesty of the situation. They did not move toward honesty. They moved toward greater deceit. But in this case, in the Entwistle case, and even in the Scott Peterson case, mm -hmm. you know, you're talking about just some of the things that apply to all of us. You really talk some too about family pressure in a way. For instance, um, in Scott Peterson's case, there was a desire to have a baby, which mm -hmm. he apparently did not share. Um, in the Entwistle case, maybe there was a live, come to America, live close right. to the family. How much did that spiral out of control. Not that that's a reason to kill somebody. No, of course. And we're not certainly blaming. We have to always be careful. We're not blaming the family. Right, the person who right. kills is responsible. But there are a whole bunch of societal pressures. And I think that the one commonality that I saw in a lot of these cases is people trying to live up to an impossible marital idea, mm. ideal. There is no perfect couple. There is no perfect family. And aiming for perfection is really a very toxic goal that can often backfire. A lot of the families that appear most perfect on the outside, behind that facade it are the most toxic secrets of all. When you're not so invested in honesty, when you're not so invested in um, looking perfect, I should say, you allow some of your flaws to come out so you don't appear as perfect. The perfect example, you gave the horrible case of, of the family that lived on Sam, Sam Donaldson's ranch. Oh. And he thought, everyone else thought, the outside world thought they were the perfect American family. And I'm still 
Do you want to yeah. tell what well, okay, that, the family background Well, okay, this is the case of Cody was. Posey. And um, the Posey family lived on Sam Donaldson's ranch. And he, in fact, described them, I believe, as the perfect all-American ranch family. And a lot of people thought that. On the outside, they looked perfect, all starched up in their Sunday best. The Sunday school teacher was so excited to have them. But then the toxic secrets started to come out. Uh, Cody Posey ultimately gunned down his entire family, killed dad, killed his stepmother, killed his stepsister. And what emerged was a litany of sadism inflicted on this child since he was a toddler. Beatings that uh, left him literally gasping for air with his uh, diapers, you know, just running with feces. I don't want to get too graphic, but the, the litany of sadism that was um, exposed at this trial showed just a stark contrast between this sort of God-fearing family that was so perfect on the outside and then this really, really sick, sick dynamic behind the scenes. What I thought was so telling was you quote so many people who came forward, people didn't didn't seem to contradict the kid. I mean, people came forward, everybody said, yeah, the guy was beating the hell out of him. I mean, you quote, I mean, was that right? I mean, that seems yeah, well, to be the general Yeah, well, here's what happened, is that, that you know, the easiest place to play dictator is with your own family. Mm -hmm. And a lot of uh, the men, and let's face it, it's usually men who are uh, abusing uh, members of their family, women and children, right. actually feel very powerless. And they feel uh, low self-esteem. And so they're not going to exhibit yeah. that kind of behavior in front of somebody like Sam Donaldson. No, right. they're going to be all perfect in front of him. But it was in front of the ranch hands, the people In front beneath. of ABC News, right. you're not going to yeah. be a jerk, right? You right. <laughs> it was the ranch hands, the guys that saw uh, who were underneath. See, a lot of these people look very much at uh, people are either here or here, and, and they kind of feel superior and inferior. They don't mm. have any sense of just two people interacting. It's all about the totem pole. Yep. And so a lot of the really, really sick behavior was witnessed by the ranch hands who didn't count. And again, what was very disturbing about that case, and I think very common, as you point mm -hmm. out, is it wasn't just... It's the intergenerational thing, as you say, the intergenerational yes. abuse, because apparently, and again, I'll let you, since you have yeah, all the details, but his, apparently the father's father beat him, and I think the father's father or the grandmother killed the, the grandfather in a murder-suicide because the, the grandfather was beating the hell out of the... That whole family, talk about oh, toxic, the whole family was... It, it's unbelievable, and you see the dysfunctionality handed from generation to generation, whether it's alcoholism, which can be genetically inherited, yep. um, spousal abuse, child abuse, these things are handed down, they're learned behaviors. And the only way really to break the cycle is for somebody to get help and therapy. And you can't imagine a bunch of cowboys really going into <laughs> right, therapy. Right, yeah. So um, it was almost preordained. And um, sadly, Cody Posey uh, was convicted, but then he was not sentenced as an adult. So it's very possible that he will get out and have a chance to, to really maybe break the cycle of violence, even though he's already killed three people, and, and live his life in a way uh, that will make sure that it's never handed down to yet another generation. Now, since you're not reporting on this objectively, as you do <laughs> for the, the camera or the, you know, when you're I, on the not job. Not objective. No, I'm I'm an opinion. Right, you're, uh, you're giving an opinion yeah. now. Do you think? I mean, honestly, I, I don't believe in murder. I do believe in self-defense. <laughs> right, right. We got the basics <laughs> there, you know. But I do believe in self-defense. Mm -hmm. And at what point, if someone, for instance, the grandmother who finally just killed her husband and killed herself. Yeah. At what point? Was the kid justified in what he did? Well, I, I debate that in the book. I talked to somebody who wants to remain anonymous who was um, pretty brutalized by her family growing up and related a lot to Cody and said, you know, I don't condone Cody's behavior. I thought of suicide, I thought of running away, but I never thought of picking up a gun and killing. But you have to understand something, is that he didn't bring guns into the equation. Right. Dad had guns there. And this is one thing I want to say because it can save lives. A lot of these murders wouldn't have occurred if there weren't guns around. Right. You know, uh, a murder can be a process, a long and gruesome process if it involves a knife. But when a gun is involved, it's an event. It's poof, and it's over. And it's very easy for somebody to make that split second horrific decision with a gun. It's a lot easier than it would be with a knife. Right, and it's and, there. You grab it, and you it's go there, for you it. Grab it. And, and in case after case, we saw the fact that access to weapons, whether it be hunting rifles, and I'm not a believer in hunting, uh, and uh, whether it's uh, sports rifles, rifles, uh, gun collections, all of these were used, not for their intended purpose, but somebody sees the gun collection, takes a gun and kills somebody. Because once that gun's there in your home, I don't care whether it's under a safe or a lock and key, 
the, the concept of death and the possibility of death has entered your life. And make no mistake about it, if you're keeping guns around the house, you never can be 100% certain that a child or a, a, a person in a drunken rage can't somehow get a hold of that gun. I've seen it where the kids manage to get through safes, they would manage to get into secret rooms, and they take that gun and they kill. Um, let me give you an example okay. in uh, Pennsylvania. There was this case of a kid who was taught to hunt, raised in a hunting family, uh, proudly shot, g gutting deer. Well, he was dating this girl who was 14. The parents said, you cannot date uh, our daughter. She's too young for you. He, he took his dad's gun, poof, executed the mother and the father. And now he is spending his entire life in prison without the possibility of parole. He's like an 18-year-old kid. So all these lives destroyed. Why? Because there was a gun collection in the house a huge cache of guns in the house. And uh, the scary part was that I was talking to local reporters and say, that's not unusual. In that area of Pennsylvania, a lot of the houses have dozens and dozens of guns. Sure. What's sure. wrong with our country? It's, uh, and you know what? A politician cannot get reelected uh, campaigning on gun control. People have We'll pick up on that in guns. just a minute, Jane. We'll be right back with Jane Velez Mitchell, author of <laughs> Secrets Can Be Murder. We are back with Jane Velez Mitchell, author of Secrets Can Be Murder. Well, early, you had mentioned the point about you know the intergenerational abuse and how it's handed down mm -hmm. from generation to generation. But I think you know it may be less extreme cases, but I think that that is common that it happens not just in it doesn't always lead to murder. But but how do you break that and how do you deal with uh, dysfunction? is handed down generation to generation, whether it's addiction, whether it's abuse in the home, uh, whether it's just sick attitudes that, that are just not appropriate for today's society. Intolerant attitudes, bigotry, hatred. The way you break the cycle is realizing that you know, you're an individual and you get to make your own choices and you don't have to inherit uh, sick belief systems and working on yourself and going into therapy or going into a 12-step program. I'm a recovering alcoholic with 12 and a half years of sobriety and I could tell you uh, that there are programs for everybody if you are an overeater, which is a huge problem in our society right now with uh, the obesity crisis. Sure. There's Overeaters Anonymous. If you have a gambling problem or a debt problem, there's Debtors Anonymous. Uh, for a drug problem, uh, whatever your issue is, and, and I personally believe everybody has something that they have to deal well, with. Okay, so there you, you can go. get help. Don't ever be ashamed of getting help. Be ashamed of your problem. As somebody once very wisely said to me, nothing I did sober in a meeting or going to a 12-step program would ever be as embarrassing as what I would do drunk. Before the show, I told you, you know, when I was reading this book, I was engrossed in it, but I walked mm -hmm. around saying to my friends, I, I won't use the full word on camera, but I said there are a lot of oh, go dysfunctional ahead. people out there. <laughs> it didn't start with a D, it was a different word. But, yeah. but how does this, as a reporter, you've covered all this stuff for years mm -hmm. and you see it. I just want to, on a personal level, does it change your view of people and society? And, and yes, it does. And, and what I try to say is that... Do you think everybody's dysfunctional and that's not the word I was going to yes. use. Yes, did you ever see that cartoon <laughs> of the meeting of the functional families and there's one person there holding their hands? Yes, I think everybody has their area that they have to deal with uh, and at least one area. Sometimes it's cross addictions and cross dysfunctions. Uh, but I also say that we can't just look at the criminals. They are the worst case scenario. Mm. On a very um, subtle level, we all uh, practice violence. And that's why, for example, I'm a vegan. I don't wear leather products. I don't eat animals because I don't want to wake up and start my day with violence on my plate, especially as an investigative journalist, having seen what happens in factory farming conditions, how pigs are kept in gestation crates where they're never allowed to turn around their entire lives. Who wants to ingest that? So while we're pointing the finger at all these violent people, let's also look at our own choices right. and realize that every choice that we make as a consumer is a political choice and it's a choice between violence and nonviolence. And that's why I like to say peace begins on your plate. And even of above and beyond peace, but I still think at a more general level when you say about the choices, a lot of times in these cases it's easy to maybe be, be judgmental or look yeah. back and say, yes, but even with the victims and say, couldn't they see it coming or didn't? But how many people in their own personal lives every day don't really see it coming or realize even, you know what I mean, in hindsight, no, it's, a, it's a very it's good easy point, to, uh, Greg, because what I noticed with a lot of these murder cases is there was an opportunity for the victim to get out before they got killed. And sometimes what we find comforting and comfortable is what we're used to, even if that situation is becoming increasingly toxic and getting more and more dangerous. Yep. Let's face it, a leading cause 
of murder for pregnant women is it, death for pregnant women is murder at the hands of the man who impregnated them. So um, intimate partner violence is a huge problem in this country, and a lot now, of times. Now it also works in reverse, just, though, right? I mean, the women do kill the. No, the it doesn't guys. work in reverse. Well, Let there's me that tell woman who killed the preacher. Yeah, the husband, there's always that woman. But it's less but, frequent. Yeah, they're 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 absolute anomalies. I mean, if women were killing men at the rate that men are killing women in this country, even for one week, we would have a national crisis. Just imagine it. Imagine if you turned on the local news and for one week you saw all these perp walks with all these suspects being women, women who rape, women who murder, women who kill, women who rob banks. We would be in an uproar. The fact is that most crime is committed by men and we have a sexist attitude toward violence because we accept male violence as business as usual. Instead of saying, what's wrong with men that they are so hooked on violence and violent solutions to their problems? Well, one thing though, and you do touch on this in the book as well, the problem is, I see it. I hear where you're, you're coming a from, guy. and I agree with you. Right, but on the <laughs> other hand, but you, but well, you have the pure physical fact that guys are generally see, but, stronger than women. So yeah, how do you deal with that? Yeah, but that doesn't mean they have to use their strength to kill. Right, uh, I agree I, with you. What but I'm saying is that we are a nation to. addicted to violence, and my message to women is: stop subsidizing the violence against you. We are training. It's classical conditioning. Back in the Victorian era, a man could get uh, turned on by seeing a woman's ankle. Today, men are getting turned on by sexually sadistic mm -hmm. violence. And that's because we have movies like Hostel 2 and Sin City and these movies that depict horrific sexually charged violence against women. So we are, we are actually training young men to get turned on by sick sexual violence. And what I say is stop subsidizing it. Women, do not go to these movies. Do not watch these TV shows. The only thing Hollywood understands is the bottom line. And if you purchase it, they will continue to make it. Well, you made a few good points there. And one of them I want to pick up on is the fact that, again, society does play a role in this. And you talk about the way that, you know, things are repressed or sexuality, that the Janet Jackson incident, how we're uncomfortable right. even these days. In general, you know, not even just men or women, but there's... So then people do weird things because right. they... So what, what's We your, live in a very puritanical society. And... The crystallizing moment that I cite in my book is when Janet Jackson exposed her breasts and you would have thought it had been another terrorist attack, the hysteria and the condemnation. At that very moment, a very sick guy who was a drug, drug addict and happened to be a father of three young girls named Joe Smith was mm. abducting little Carly Bruscia mm. in Florida, raping her and killing her. The outcry over the horrific violence inflicted on this innocent little girl did not in any way measure up to the absolute outrage over Janet Jackson's breast. And, and so my point is, when we, when we stop criminalizing sexuality and nudity, maybe we'll have fewer sex criminals. The, the shame-based thinking that that sick addict, that demented man had, is all about sex is dirty, sex is a crime, sex is evil. Right. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. In Europe, people are, I was are just naked, women say, are topless, exactly. nobody blinks so it is, eye. Right, I, I love going to vacation in Europe, been to Germany and Beirut, seen mm -hmm. the naked sure. people, dozens sure. of naked Germans in the parks. And you come home to America, and all of a sudden, as you and, and what's so funny about it is a lot of times it's, it's a uh, conservative religious element that's, that's very intolerant. When, if you look at the Bible, the purest state of man was Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden when they didn't even know they were naked. Right after the Janet Jackson incident, I was in Amsterdam. Okay, it was Amsterdam. But I was at a, I'm a sure Saturday, you were, Greg. Saturday night, opening for a big Hollywood movie. It was opening worldwide. <laughs> um, date move, well, not a date movie, it was an action flick, but a lot of people, couples were there, people mm -hmm. on dates, filled theater. The commercials before the theater would have caused a scandal in America. It showed a woman breastfeeding full on, didn't leave anything to the imagination, yeah. saw everything. Crowded movie theater, people there with friends and family, nobody commented, blinked an eye. Right. America was an uproar over Janet Jackson. These people in Europe sat at the screen like, okay, when's the commercial going to be over? When I'm going to the next one? It's just way different over there. Yeah, and we have to wonder, why do we have such a violence problem in our society? And it's worse than in other countries. And because we have a, we have a culture that's addicted to violence, we use it for news, then we use it for entertainment. And, I mean, I'm part of it, too. Look, I'm writing a book about, right. because that's what um, the opportunities are. So I tried to make my book about peace and about nonviolence in the context of covering these. Uh, but yet, it's very hard to get out of it because everybody wants it. We're a nation addicted to violence. In fact, we're, we're, we're an addict nation in a lot of ways. We have, you know, we're, we're, we're commuting long distances to and from. Um, houses were consuming most of the world's resources, destroying the planet in the process, and yet are we really happy? Because happiness is an inside job. We can't shop our way to happiness. We can't eat our way to happiness. We can't drink our way to happiness. We have to 
experience it internally and that's a process that is not just about consuming so we have to look at our consumer society very seriously and and and, and start making changes as i said every decision we make throughout the course of the day is a political you, decision. I was touched by the way you ended the book because you said something like, you know, look people, learn from this, use your head. Every Throughout your life, every day do this, and I'll try to do the same, and I was very touched right. by that. Right, I mean, so I we, we have to start intercepting violence before it becomes homicidal. We're very interested in punishing people, which I believe criminals should be punished. We have more prisons than any other country in the world, more prisoners, and, and violence is not stopping. So obviously the solution is prevention. Let's take all that money that we're using for the war in Iraq and put it into early childhood education and give some of these kids a chance at therapy and working through their problems and, and, and getting off the cycle of dysfunction that they've inherited from their parents, and maybe we won't have so much crime in America. We will be right back with Jane Blaise Mitchell, author of Secrets Can Be Murder. And we are back with Jane Velez Mitchell, author of Secrets Can Be Murder. Well, you touch on, in, in the book, when we talk about society, you also talk about the t part that TV and the movies play, mm -hmm. as well as the media. Yes. And since, as you say, you're a part of it, yes. um, you've covered this, you're obviously concerned about it. But what role does the media play in this? And also, a lot of people want to know, why do certain cases get coverage when others don't? You yeah. hear about, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of murders in America every year. Yes. Why does Scott, the Scott Peterson case become national news or O.J. Simpson? Well, okay, there's a celebrity factor there, but, but why do some cases make the headlines and some cases just as bad, perhaps, or maybe worse, right. you never hear about it. I talk about a little formula that, that it's not that, uh, you know, there's evil people sitting there checking off little boxes, but mm. there are certain cases that are kind of like a perfect storm. And they're the kind of cases that if they were movies, they would be the perfect movie plot. Mm. You know, they have all the elements. They've got maybe very attractive people, like Scott Peterson, a handsome guy, uh, Neil Entwistle, a very handsome family, mm. uh, Natalie Holloway, very uh, beautiful young lady. Um, they've got um, an exotic locale sometimes. For example, the Aruba disappearance of Natalie Holloway, a terrible tragedy, and right. my heart goes out to uh, her mother, uh, Beth Twitty, who has worked so hard to try to find her daughter, and I've spoken with her many times. Uh, so you, know, you have these sort of glamorous elements that um, allow people to almost view it as a real life movie, and they're kind of living vicariously through it. I mean, they're, they're experiencing, uh, when they're watching the, the shows, they're seeing the exotic locales, they're seeing the attractive people, and so it becomes like a movie. And, and, and people are watching. As you say, these stories rate. I mean, they're, they're the producers affluence, are watching the ratings. Affluence and, is another issue. Yeah. I mean, we don't, we don't cover as much uh, a crime involving extremely poor people as we do people mm. who are middle class or affluent. There's a more of a glamour angle to that. So, you know, I don't blame the media. The media reflects society. I tell everybody, look in the mirror and think about the choices you make. If you're sitting there watching this stuff, it's going to rate, and if it rates, they're going to cover it. Let me tell you something. The media gets overnights, and they know if a story doesn't rate. And if a story doesn't rate, it's going to go away, and it's just going to be covered. It's nuts and bolts. Mm. But if a story rates... And you've seen that happen, where it yeah, just people say, well, this is not... They'll, you know, they'll say, the story's rating. We're going to do it, you know, because mm. that's what people want to see. So they can't blame the media because it's the people making the decisions. And if you believe what everybody told you, um, you would believe that nobody watches television. How many, how many people say that? I don't watch television. Oh, so you didn't see the planes going to the World Trade Center, I suppose. Oh, well, no, I saw that. Well, how come you know about blah, 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 that you would have to know if you watch television? People lie to themselves and to others about their viewing habits. If, if to, you to, talk to somebody, you think everybody watched PBS sure, and Charlie right. Rose. Yeah, yeah. You know, people just don't want to be honest about what they don't really they wish. watch. <laughs> um, but what do you think then to the people who say that but some cases take on a life of their own because of the media coverage. I think, and you even you say that well, in the book. that's true, that, yeah. You know, that because it's a hot story, it becomes a hotter story. I don't know, it's kind of like, like a Paris Hilton thing where nobody knows why, well, but Paris it happens. the Paris Hilton thing was the, was the <laughs> nader. I mean, that, that, and I was in it. I mean, I got called to talk about it, and I did talk about it, and we got all wrapped up in a vortex. And what happens is that if it is a hot story that rates, and, and then one station starts covering, or one network, and then the others have to remain competitive. So it kind of feeds on itself and it becomes a sort of snowball situation where it takes on a life of its own and suddenly nobody's in control and it's just this out of control freight train. You see it with these cases. Uh, O.J. Simpson was the penultimate example that's still going on to this day. Right, yep. And uh, you see it with a lot of these cases. It just, there's so many characters. Everybody who gets involved somehow gets trapped and their secrets end up spilling out and it's just this 
non-stop half Shakespearean drama, half soap opera, and people are just completely hooked on it. Well, thank you very much for being here today, Jane. I sure appreciate it. The book is Secrets Can Be Murdered. Jane Velez Mitchell, you can see her on CNN, Headline News, Court TV, all over the place. Thanks, everybody, for watching. We'll see you next time.